Welcome everyone to Epic Encounters. I hope you enjoy this week's message. I'm confident that the message from this series will meet you exactly where you are. Stay tuned for an epic journey. John, the book of John, the eighth chapter, verse number one, starting at number one, and I will finish around verse number 11. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, verse number two, he awoke early in the morning to return to the temple. When he arrived, the people surrounded him, so he sat down and began to teach them. While he was teaching, the scribes and Pharisees brought in a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And they stood her before Jesus. Watch this, verse number four. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Moses says in the law that we are to kill such women by stoning. What do you say about it? We want to know your take on it, Jesus. What, what do you have? Now, Moses says, Moses says that, that when we find women that are guilty of such acts, that we're supposed to take them out uh, before the city and throw rocks at them. But, but Jesus, what do you say? What should we do about it? Verse number six this they said, tempting Jesus. They tried to get Jesus caught up. That they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he didn't hear him at all. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he bent down again and wrote in the dust. And when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No one, master. Neither do I, said Jesus. Go on your way. From now on, don't sin. Say, go about your way, but from now on, don't sin. Real quickly, I want to look at verse number six again. That's where our key scripture is going to come from. This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, watch this, as though he heard them not. As though he heard them not not as though he didn't hear him today i want to talk to you from one simple word today i want to talk to you about silence i want to talk to you about silence silence that's what we're going to talk about we're going to end this series about the lord speaking about god speaking we want to end it today with silence with silence anybody like me and it's you know i got to Tell the truth because my parents are here. Anybody like me, you hate it when you got caught doing something wrong. And, and I didn't mind being busted. I didn't mind being caught. But one thing I didn't want the principal to do, one thing I didn't want the teacher to do, one thing that I didn't want the neighbor to do is say, I'm going to call your mama. Anybody in here besides me didn't want to get a phone call or, or, or get caught and have them say, I'm going to call your mom. And, and this was the reason why I didn't want them to call. See, this was before the cell phone days, y'all. You know what I mean? They didn't just text your mom and say, we got to talk to you, uh, uh, Miss Seaford, when you get home. But, but they, they would call your mama, and this is when you knew that you were going to show enough get in trouble, where you were going to make some enemies at the house is that they had the nerve to call your parents at work. It wasn't that you got a phone call from the school. Am I lying, Mom? It wasn't that they called you, because everybody cuts up. Am I, am, I, am, I, am I right, Papa Mark, in the back? But the fact that they had the nerve to call me while I'm here dealing with these idiots on my job, but I got to stop dealing with them so that I can deal with you. Oh, my God. Anybody felt the fear of that? I didn't quite get it until I became a parent. Uh-oh. And, and I became a parent, and I had to deal with the fools at work. I had to deal with 
the workload and, and I had to deal with all the emails and stuff that I needed to get done and, and, and you get a phone call from the principal right here saying that, you know what, your child was involved in an altercation. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Or your child failed to turn their work, homework in on time for the last six weeks. But meanwhile, they come home every day in front of the PlayStation and say, did you do your homework? Yeah, it's done. And so you get these phone calls, and you, didn't, you don't quite understand until you become a parent, and you realize how angry you become when these people are calling me at work, and it's a non-emergency. How does that make you feel? I'm irritated. I'm frustrated. And, and, and God better be interceding for somebody because I'm going to beat somebody when I get home. Why? Because you put a halt in my day. You've inconvenienced my day for some foolishness that could have been avoided. Got these people calling me up here now. And now my coworkers are listening because you know they're ear hustling. My coworker is now in the next cubicle listening and they hear my conversation with the principal. And you try to get your voice lower and lower. And it seems like the lower and lower I drop my voice, the more hard, the harder they start to listen. You get up from your cubicle and say, can, can I be excused for a minute? I got to take, take an unexpected 10-minute uh, break. Oh, 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 is everything all right at the school? That's how you know they listen to your conversation. You okay? Is everything all right at the school? And you're like, ah. Oh. Then they hit you with one of these, yeah. Well, if you need to go and take care of that, Shante, go ahead and take care of that. You're like, well, you know, you don't need to be hiding it now. Didn't quite understand it till I was a parent. And you realize people are now calling me at my job over my kids. I want you to think how Jesus felt. Here it is. Jesus is in the temple. He's teaching. He's preaching. He does what, he's lo what he loves to do. He's doing his passion. He's doing his priestly thing. He's doing his rabbi thing. He's doing his, his master teacher thing. And he's there. And all of a sudden, you got these group of Pharisees pulling this woman into the temple in the middle of his preaching and teaching. Can you imagine how, how almighty God felt in human flesh that he's in the middle of teaching and preaching and prophesying? and doing deliverance and somebody brings one of his kids in off the street and says guess what we just caught your kid doing I want you to think and take your mind there and you can kind of identify with how Jesus felt Jesus is working it y'all Jesus is in the middle of his hustle and bustle and all of a sudden he has to stop his work life y'all gonna see me in a minute he has to stop and put his work on pause because somebody is now making an accusation of one of his kids Brings them in and says, guess what I saw your child doing, Jesus? Guess what I saw your daughter caught up in, Jesus? Guess what we watched your kids doing while you weren't there at home? Y'all feel me? Please tell me you feel me. Maybe some of us on here only got kids that are mischievous. So they're harassing Jesus. Interrupt Jesus while he's at work to her harassing him and, and threatening him and they come to him and say well, well Well, Jesus according to the law of Moses the law of Moses says That anyone that gets caught in adultery Well, you got to bring them before the city and you got to stone them According to the law of Moses. That's what has to happen now. Now Jesus. I got to ask you a question We caught her red-handed now. What are you gonna do? This is interesting. We, we, we know that the woman was caught in adultery, but, but Scripture tells us, according to Deuteronomy 22 and 22, this is why we believe this woman not to be a married woman, but actually a betrothed or engaged woman. Because Deuteronomy 22 and 22 is the only place in Scripture that properly identifies that a stoning is the right judgment call to make on someone that's betrothed caught in a scandal. Y'all going to hear me in a minute. So it wasn't. That she caught, that he caught this young lady fooling around on her husband. He caught this wife to be fooling around. The Pharisees caught this wife to be fooling around on their husband. Now you have to understand that in order to understand this, in order to feel where I'm coming from, in order to understand the opportunity here by the Pharisees, you have to understand how accusations work against adultery. You're going to accuse somebody of adultery. First of all, 
You got to actually catch them in the actual act of adultery. No, not, not, oh, I seen him leaving her house at midnight. None of that, well, you know what, he, he, he fled the house and, and, and he left out the back window. No, no stuff like that. Uh, I, I saw some emails and text messages. No, no, it wasn't like that. In, in, in Pharisaic law, according to the law of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, you actually had to catch them in the act. Not only did you have to catch them in the act, but you needed to have two or more people as witnesses that caught them in the actual act. The third thing is, and this is where we messed up at, and this is where we get ourselves in trouble, Pharisees, is that not only do you bring the woman who got accused or, or who, got a, who got in trouble with adultery, but you got to bring the man forward too. So this is where we see that first of all, we got a setup. First of all, Jesus, this looks like trumped up charges because you had no problem bringing the woman before Jesus, but where's homeboy at? Where's homeboy at? So that's why I have some problems with this. Brought the woman, left the man. Problem number two is the fact that you sat there, watch this, the fact that you sat there the whole time and actually watched them in the act speaks to a whole different problem, Pharisees, with voyeurism. And, and God messed with me on this one because it let me know that our generation isn't the only generation that ever struggled with pornography. In order for you to catch them in the act, somebody had to be watching. We weren't the only generation that struggled with pornographic material. Oh, no, this happened at least. The struggle was real about up to 4,000 years ago, y'all. I need some brothers in here to say, help me, Lord. Okay, y'all going to be fake right now, okay. I'm trying to help you out and let you know that this ain't a new problem. I'm trying to help you brothers out and let you know this ain't a new demon. I'm trying to help you out to let you know that you don't need deliverance over a new issue. But Jesus had to deal with voyeurism and folks watching pornographic material for at least 4,000 years ago. But you go ahead and remain silent and cute. I'll be the only one that raises my hand, I guess. Yeah, I, I can only imagine these, 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 these brothers that are sitting there watching this stuff, probably groping themselves under their tunic. The second thing is, the part, third problem I have with the issue is that there, there is a word for somebody that, that needs to understand this. The, the other part of this that I have an issue with is that somebody, can you imagine, and, and we've all been there before. Some of you have been there before where you have somebody on the outside trying to tell you how to discipline your kids. You gonna hear me? You gonna hear me out on this one? Can I speak on it? Don't, you know, it, it's bad enough that you caught my kids doing something wrong. It's bad enough that you caught my kids with their hands in the cookie jar. It's bad enough that my kids lied about stealing from you. But, but the problem I have, principal, y'all gonna feel me. The problem I have, Sister Erlene, uh, the problem I have, neighbor, is that you sit here and now want to tell me how to discipline my kids. And I don't say nothing about you and your bad kids. Don't you? You did cross the line now. I appreciate you turning state's evidence over on my kids. I appreciate you snitching, dry snitching on my kids. But see, you cross the line when you get to think that you got the audacity to tell me how I should discipline my kids. I want you to see this, y'all. This is where the Pharisees cross the line. Jesus, according to the law of Moses, what you should do with your kids is you should bring them to the front of the city and you ought to stone them. Jesus says, now wait up a minute. You don't tell me how I should whoop my kids. You don't tell me how I'm supposed to deal with Ray Little when he gets out of line. You don't tell me how I should deal with Mary when she stops praise, praising me and worshiping me. You don't tell me what to do with my kids. I'll distribute punishment the way I think punishment ought to be distributed. Somebody say amen. amen. See, I know what the problem is. I'm getting off my notes now. I know what the problem is. Because you got caught when you got caught, God kicked the mess out of you. And you think because I get caught on the same thing that he should kick the mess out of me, but he don't. He just tells me, go and sin no more. 
When you got caught up, you had to file divorce for doing the same issue that your husband caught you doing. When you got caught up, you had to file divorce. You lost your kids because of the mess you got into. But when I get in trouble, I see what you see is restoration at work. What you see is healing at work. What you see is deliverance at work. Don't tell God how to reprimand his kids. I know it messed you up, didn't it? It messed you up. D D Davis, I believe uh, one writer said, my foot almost slipped when I started thinking. See, that's the problem. Some of you didn't almost slip, but you went on and fell down because you was looking at your neighbor's business too long. I know it messed you up. It messed you up. It messed you up because you were like, God, I got the right prescription for a jerk like them. God, I got the right prescription for a whoremonger like them. God, I got the right prescription for a lying, backstabbing heathen like them. Lord, why don't you dry their accounts up for, for six months like you did mine when I didn't pay tithes, Lord? You ain't going to do nothing to them like that? How is it they don't pay tithes and they still get a new car at house? Had to dab That's what messed you up. That's what messed you up. It's the fact you now see that all, all reprimands ain't equal. Anyways, let me get back to the lesson. So we're here and we see what happens. Verse 6, key text, I'm almost done. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Watch this, as if he heard them not. In other words, Jesus heard the accusations about what I should do with my kids. He heard the accusation of how I should discipline my kids. He heard the accusation of how I should stone this girl, but you know what he did? He ignored them. I'm so glad that Jesus ignores my accusers when they come against me. I'm so glad that Jesus sits in heaven and says, I hear what you say we should do with Shante, Satan, but you know what? I got my own plans for his life. I got my own agenda for what I'm going to take him and his family through. So he says, he heard them. He responded as though he heard them. Not, I like this because the next part of the scripture, uh, I like that part where it says Jesus stoops down. You got to understand this, this should make every believer smile. Why? Jesus stoops now. Oh, because now we see him stoop down in the position of a judge. We see him get in his judge postures and says, okay, now if you really want me to judge matters, well, let me go ahead and judge matters. Let me take out my finger and get to right now. Looking at this and and Jesus goes silent. Now, real quickly, we learn that God speaks in three common ways. The first week, we learn that God speaks in a logos word. Logos word mean, he, means he thinks before he speaks. Anybody been thinking before they speak lately? Or are we still suffering from put your foot in your mouth disease? Number two, what he thinks about is before he speaks, the other common way is God gives a rhema word. A rhema word is, I need it right now, God. A right now word. But the third word, the third way that God speaks a word or gets his message across to people is through silence. God can say more in silence than he can with any word in the English vocabulary. God speaks louder sometimes through silence than he does through any of the scriptures that you've ever read. Sometimes the fact that he didn't say, say nothing speaks louder than what he did say. Anybody ever had God go silent on you? Anybody, okay, I'm the only one again. Anybody in here by, 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 a, by a show of hands, by a living color, Damon Wayne, show of hands. Anybody, anybody in here ever have God just shut heaven on you? Anybody ever have his voice cut off from you? Anybody ever been tarrying for weeks maybe months, and you still haven't heard a word from the Lord. Can I tell you, if you ever went a long period of time serving God in this community of believers, you're going to go through some things where God doesn't speak at all audibly. But can I tell you, his silence is him speaking anyway. Sometimes God's silence speaks louder than his word. Real quickly, one of the reasons when 
when you go through God speaking silent or God going through, through taking you through a silent period, what God is doing is taking his time to review everything that you gave him. Can I tell you something? You and I sit there and we start unloading on heaven. God, I need you to bless my kids. God, I need you to bless me on my job. God bless Gladys. God bless Janet. God bless Erlene, bless Ray. And we start unloading on everything we need God to do. Don't you understand? God has to sit up there and say, wait a minute. Let me actually review everything you asked for. Sometimes God is going silent. I want you to hear me out. Sometimes God is going silent because he's actually taking time to review all the stuff that you asked him for. He's finding out that the stuff that you asked him for, not all of it is actually needs. Most of it is probably wants. Somebody say preach Cephas. Here was the other thing that got me. The Pharisees came to Jesus with a judicial question. But Jesus responds with a moral answer. Did y'all catch that? They came wanting Jesus to respond or do something based on the law. But Jesus understands the answer to your situation has nothing to do with legal. It has no legal, uh, it's not a legal problem. But the answer for your situation has nothing to do with the judicial system. The answer for your problem is moral. There's a moral deficit right there. There's a moral insensitivity right there. The morality of this chick is wrong. Ain't nothing wrong with her breaking the law, but it's the morality in her heart that needs to be corrected. And we sit here and and we think about some of us in here because some of us, we want Jesus to move in and we want him to suspend laws. We want him to suspend judicial laws. Lord, come in and change the laws. Lord, we want you to change the laws of physics. Lord, we want you to change universal laws. And God said, I didn't come to break laws. I came to fulfill laws. The problem is not with me tampering with any laws. The laws of physics, the laws of the universe, judicial laws. The problem is, is I got to deal with the morality climate in your generation. I'm almost done. And so what we see here is, <clears throat> we're looking here and, and, and we're asking God to do these things. And, and he sees that the Pharisees are the ones making the accusations. Can I, can I help us out? Because God dealt with me on this. Some, sometimes the reason why God goes silent it's because he looks at some of the things that we pray for are actually accusations, but they're not actually needs that need to be done right now. What are you talking about? This is why God went silent or Jesus went silent on the Pharisees. How dare you make an accusation? Watch this. How dare you make an accusation and confront me about what somebody else is doing when you haven't confessed to what you're doing yet? Can I help somebody out in here, please? The reason why God is going silent on you is because the stuff that you're, that you're asking God to do, God is saying, I'll fix them once I fix you. I'm not going to respond to your prayer about what somebody else or how somebody else's life needs to come together until we fix what's going wrong in your life first. You want to pray about your neighbor's behavior. You want to pray about your neighbor getting their mind together. And, and, and Lord, can you help my coworker get their mind right? And they got a salty attitude. And, and I can't nobody stand to work with them, Lord. And, and, and I need, you just need to move her to another department. And God is saying, I will deal with your coworker once we fix you. I'm not responding to any prayers that you're making, uh, that you're making accusations against that you're guilty of the same issue. So until we fix you, I'm going to be silent on what you just prayed for about somebody else. You want to know why God's been silent lately? Somebody say, there it is. Asking for somebody to, to fix your behavior. God's been messing with me on this one. You want somebody to fix your, your, your neighbor's behavior and, and your wife's behavior. Oh, God, I'm telling on myself. Your wife's behavior and your kid's behavior and your boss's behavior. What about your behavior, Shante? What about the, every time you're in a conversation with somebody, you always feel like you got to correct them? Uh-oh. Maybe Shante's the only person that does that in here when you're talking to somebody and you think you always got to go behind them and correct their answer. You know, that's the sign of your behavior needs to be corrected. You're talking with somebody and, and you always think that you got to have the last word in. 
you're talking with somebody and, and you always think that, that your problem is greater than their problem. That what you're going through, your stuff, is worse than their stuff. God says those are behavior, bad behavior traits. We're going to fix their behavior once we fix yours. I'm sorry, I said they behavior, their behavior, bright kid, their behavior. Back there, God going to deliver you back there trying to correct me. She's my autocorrect, y'all, when I'm preaching. You know, so, you know, you text it, you got to, that's my autocorrect when I'm preaching. Don't say, don't say he and bright kids, say bright key and I. Quit using words like liked it. Anyway. <laughs> Stop saying be more pacific when you're supposed to be specific. Maybe I'm the only one. Amen. So, uh, y'all pray for me. So, <laughs> so, so what Jesus, so what Jesus sees is like, look, I can't fix somebody else's behavior or somebody else's issue. I can't respond to your prayer when there's a need in your life to confess over the same thing. Mm -hmm. God touched them. Why they got to be so loose and, and why they got to, what they got to, what, what, what do you think about at night? Who do you text during the day? Who do you talk to on the long drive home before you get to the house? God is saying, I'll, I'll correct them once I can get you to confess over what's going on. Until then, guess what? I'm going to remain silent. Somebody say, Lord, speak. Lord, speak. Real quickly, I'm moving on. Uh, uh, there's an issue of moral competence versus moral incompetence. God, Jesus is there, and he's looking at them, and he's looking at these Pharisees, and he's saying to himself, out of all of these Pharisees here, which one can, is really competent enough that is going to actually throw the first stone? Because I know a lot of y'all's home history. I know what happened to a lot of y'all back in the temple when you were younger. I know what you did last summer. And so God is looking at it and says, who's, who's morally incompetent right here? Morally, there's some of us that can't stand and can't do the same thing. So I, I see what's going on here. Jesus says, I'm not even going to respond to that mess. You know, Jesus is a lot like you and I. We were created in the image of God. So the foolishness that you don't stand for, what makes us think that God does? Some of the stuff that people do that you choose not to respond. You know, some people throw some texts out there sometimes. They throw some phone calls out there sometimes, some emails out there sometimes. And what do we say, Jason? You know what? I ain't even going to respond to that. So now you understand how God does when somebody throws prayers out there sometimes. When we, when I say things sometimes, God says, you know what, Shante? That was so stupid. I ain't even going to respond to that. You want to know why God's been silent lately, right? So this is my favorite part. We get to John, the eighth chapter, verse number nine, number nine, and this is what he says. He says, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience. I love this. The word conscience there means fault. This is what happened after God writes in the sand, after Jesus writes in the sands. What scripture says is they begin to get convicted or they begin to find their own faults. Don't you understand? In order to reverse God and get Jesus to speak again, in order to get God to speak again in your own life, you've got to start looking at yourself and start identifying your own faults. Well, maybe I did talk too much. Okay, maybe I did lie. You know, I, I probably exact, no, I lied. I embellished, no, I lied. We start looking at our own fault. Maybe I didn't need to talk to my wife like that in front of company. We start looking at our own fault. Maybe I didn't, Lord, help me, help me, Lord. Maybe I didn't need to talk to the kids like that in front of their friends. Help me, Lord, help me. It, it, we start looking at our own faults. You know, maybe, maybe I do need to start paying Verizon when I say I'm going to pay them. Amen. I can't keep making payment arrangements three months in a row. Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord. Start looking at your own faults. Scripture says that the Pharisees started looking at their own faults. Before you start criticizing him for being big-headed, stubborn, ignorant, and set in his ways, start looking at your own faults. I can't get no lower than this, y'all. That's, that's the lowest I'm going to go. Start looking. He said the Pharisees started identifying their own faults. Before I can start speaking to you about somebody else, 
You have to first give up state's evidence about what's wrong with you. I'm done beating that dead horse. Jesus shows off his divinity. I like this. I like this because over 2,000 years ago, oh goodness, there was a man by the name of Moses that had tablets and, and Jesus and God, almighty God, wrote on the tablets and wrote down one of the Ten Commandments and said, thou will not commit adultery. Here we go 10,000 years later and Jesus is faced with a woman that's caught in adultery and he takes out his finger and starts writing in the ground. Oh, y'all gonna see this. And in in, in 2,000 years before, God wrote on the tablets with his finger. He wrote on stone saying, thou, sh thou shalt not commit adultery. But now we have Jesus being confronted by a woman that's in, uh, in adultery, and he's writing on the ground with his finger. And he said, I dare one of you to pick up a stone to throw it at her. Did y'all catch that? Instead of writing a stone, he says, instead of writing a stone, he dares them to cast the first stone. And I like this. God wrote the first time because they were a people that had no judicial, judicial laws. That's why he came to them in Exodus. That's why he came to them with Moses and said, hey, y'all got to get some organization. You got to get some civil matters straight. He said, you need to put laws or a judicial system in place. Here it is 2,000 years later. Jesus stopped by and says, you know what? The judicial system ain't what's wrong here, but it's the moral system around here. You need to put a moral system in place in order to make things right. Somebody say, help us, Lord. Why is that, Jesus? Because the law, the judicial law, doesn't know or recognize forgiveness. You understand that? We're banking on the government to fix some things for believers. Keep waiting. We're banking on the government that they're going to stand up and make civil matters straight for believers. And God is saying, I didn't come to do that. He said, listen, the only thing that's going to make your generation straight, the only thing that's going to make your world straight is you got to get the moral conscience right in your generation. I'm not going to touch the judicial system. I'm not going to touch the legal system. I'm not going to touch the civic system, but what I came to do is to deal with the moral equilibrium that's off. I'm done. The reason why Jesus understands this is because truth be told, most of the mistakes that you and I make, and he understands this with the woman caught in adultery. He says most of the mistakes that you and I are going to make are not going to be judicial mistakes. Most of the mistakes that you and I are going to make are going to be moral mistakes. Said, and for moral mistakes, there's a lot of forgiveness there. For moral mistakes, there's a lot of long suffering there. For moral mistakes, there's a lot of grace there. That's what I came to deal with. Stand to your feet. I'm done. Stand to your feet said, I came to deal with that. I came to deal with the matters of the conscience. I came to deal with the things that's been eating you up inside. He said, I can, he said, I can constitute forgiveness easily for moral mistakes. And see, that, that's the problem because some of us in here are looking at God and we're expecting him to respond judicially. We're expecting, it. We're expecting God to, to respond legalistically. And he said, I didn't come for that. I came to help you out to get you right morally. I don't know about you, but I need God to start talking to me. I need God to continue to speak to me. But there's some things that I can tell you and I can be very honest about. That in our own lives, we're holding up the conversation and it's being held up on our end, not his end. Did you catch that? The conversation is being held up on our end and not his end. He said, I'm going to speak to some of y'all and start speaking again. I will disconnect or discontinue the silence once some of us in here start accepting fault for what we need to accept fault for. Amen? Is there anybody in here that's not afraid to say, you know what? Before I judge you, I need to judge me. I need to judge me 
I need to get some of my mistakes straight before I try to call out yours. I need to try to get some of my inconsistencies straight before I speak against yours. I like this, and, and, and I like this because there was so there's so many hidden nuggets in there. I, I, I started reading this scripture, the text here on adultery, and it gave me conviction. It said, how dare we talk about who's cheating on who in the community of believers? Jesus showed me, said, first of all, y'all got it wrong. Were any of y'all there to witness it? God, I hope you were. God, I hope you were. Said, really, you couldn't come in front of, bring anybody in front of the church and put your mouth on anybody unless you had two witnesses and you were actually there having an eyewitness account of what happened. Yeah, I know you heard that so-and-so broke up and what they broke up over. I, I know you heard why, why sister and brother got divorced. I, I know why you heard why that pastor lost his church. But I'm telling you right now, unless you've been in the room to witness anything, don't put your mouth on anybody's marriage. I know I got off task with that word. But that's just the word. Maybe that word was just for me. Maybe that word was just for me. I said, in order for you to speak to adultery, you had to be there to witness it. And I had to repent. It was just me, Jason. I had to repent. Because how dare I talk about what happened or criticize in somebody else's marriage. And I wasn't there to witness it. Amen? I'm sorry. I'll get off of that one. Who, who needs God to talk again? Who needs God to speak again? You go, we talk all the time. Really? Really? No, I need God to speak. And, and, and when God's speaking, I need him to speak louder and louder. Amen, because I'm hard hit, y'all. So I just really, this, this prayer is probably not for the masses. This altar call is probably not for everybody in here. It's just for specific people in here that know that God hasn't spoke to you in a while. You feel like heaven has been silenced to you. You feel like heaven has been silent, has been, the, 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 the volume has been cut off from heaven. We want to pray with you. We want to pray with you. And this is what God's going to do. He's not going to have me or any of the ministers here pray for you, start telling you about what's wrong in your life. We're going to pray that the eyes of your understanding open up so that God can show you what's wrong with you. I believe that most of us in here know our faults, but we don't want to confess them. Confession is needed today. You can't leave today without confessing on yourself. Matter of fact, everybody come to the altar. We're going to start, we're going to start turning our own dirty laundry in right now. Oh my God, I just, just turned into a sanctified laundry mat right now. We're going to start turning, handing our dirty laundry. Cut the music, come on. Everybody's going to start handing their dirty laundry over right now. You're going to start telling on yourself right now. We are going to start talking about our own faults. I, I could be Hello. We want to thank you for watching this segment. We would like to hear more from you. Please follow us and connect with us via social media outlets. We want to offer you an opportunity to partner with us. We can do more together. Below is the information on how you can be part of bringing this message from our community to yours. And before you leave, take our model with you. More compassion, fewer complaints.